Thank you all. So he said we got three hours to talk? Something like that. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is we'll go through kind of my background. Uh, today is about y'all. You know, I've already, I've already done my deal. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm successful in what I want to do in life. Now is about y'all learn a little bit about what I do and hopefully can help you in life too. So I um, want to try to keep this 30, 40 minutes and give y'all a lot of time to ask questions. And um, is, it, is Mike okay? Okay, you're good. All right, uh, ask questions. That way, you, you know, you can ask me anything you want. If I don't want to answer, I'll tell you. So uh, feel free uh, from that end. Um, how many of y'all class-wise is juniors, seniors, mostly seniors in this class? Is this one of these like senior classes that's easy and all that good stuff that everybody wants to take? Is that how it is, Eric? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, hopefully this is, this is, to me, a class like this would probably be a fun class where you get to kind of use your brain power that you've been working on here the last two or three years and be able to kind of apply it in a little different format. But what I'm going to do is I'll tell you about my background, and then since we're in the entrepreneurial side of things, I'm going to go a little bit more in the business aspect of it, because that may be some of the questions that, that y'all may have and kind of how I got to where I am now. Now, I was here about three or four weeks ago speaking to the engineering group. Was anybody in here? All right, I'm going to try not to repeat some stuff. So I'll try not to, to, to do that since we're talking about a few other things. But background-wise, I'm, I'm from Cleveland, Mississippi. Does anybody from the Delta? We got any Delta guys? All right, we got a few Delta people here, good. So I was born and raised in Cleveland, and uh, my father was just like kind of, kind of, kind of every, any other father in the Delta. If you want to make some money, you had to be doing more than one job. So uh, I kind of saw my dad at a young age. You know, he had an insurance company, a bonding company. He owned a Hancock Fabrics, and my mom taught school. So that was kind of the, the lifestyle I kind of lived, which was pretty good as a young kid. Uh, but I lived in Cleveland for 13 years. And in uh, Cleveland, uh, I was pretty athletic, so I was, I was the big kid. I dominated a lot of sports and all that good stuff. But then I got introduced to uh, what competition was all about. We moved to Plano, Texas. Anybody here from Texas? All right. Anybody, everybody, everybody knows where Plano's at? Okay, all right, all right. So um, when I moved to Plano, Texas, that's where competition started. So in Mississippi, you know, I played sports, and, and uh, I, I always started. Didn't have any problems with that. Didn't have to work hard at it. In Texas, my graduating class in high school was 1,600 kids. All right, and two grades, uh, you're, 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 you, had a, you had a high school, which was 9th and 10th, and you had a senior high school, which was 11th and 12th. So 11th and 12th grade, were over 3,000 kids, sort of like a mini college campus. So anything you did in that world is you had to learn how to compete. So, so from a competition standpoint, and I'm, what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is, is how my mind, the mindset changed a little bit. You got two mindsets. You got people with a fixed mindset, and you got people with a growth mindset. Fixed mindset's like this. I'm as smart as I'm ever going to be. You know, my mama gave me an IQ test when I was a little kid, and that's all, that's all I got. The growth mindset is I can learn, I can become whatever I want to, what, whatever I want to be. And what I was able to, to understand in Texas is the growth mindset, is, is how if you want it bad enough, you train hard enough, you can get it. So that was kind of an aha moment to me when I, was, when I, when I lived in, the, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that area. Well, being a Mississippi guy from Mississippi, you know, graduating uh, from high school in Texas, um, I didn't know, but th there were only two colleges that exist, Mississippi State and Ole Miss back in those days, you know, because I was brainwashed as a kid. So I came back to school here uh, majoring in engineering. And uh, any, any engineers in here? Good, we got a bunch of them, right? We got any business people in here? Okay, all right. Um, the, uh, and when I came, first, first off, I was going to major. My dad had a civil engineering degree, too. My dad's kind of like me. He's got a lot of things he likes to do. So he had an industrial engineering degree, had a civil engineering degree. So I said, I'm going to try civil. So when I went, went to one surveying class, that was enough for me. I'm done. Uh, and I had interest on the mechanical side of it. And my interest is, is more of uh, thermodynamics, fluid flow, stuff like that is what I like. I don't like gears. I don't like engines. I don't like stuff that turns. I don't want to get greasy. So um, my focus was... That, that whole field is a thermodynamics focus of it. And when I came to school, I'd made good grades in Texas. I wanted to make sure I built a resume 
that, that I could go get any job I wanted. I wanted to make sure that I came to school to learn. Because one big thing that you'll find out in life is in high school, you know, you got the jocks and you got the guys that are in, in the girls that are real popular and all that good stuff. Well, when you get to college, there's a reset button. When you get to college, everything resets and everybody's equal again. Well, guess what happens? In school, you got the four-point guys, you got three-five guys, you got the two-five guys. But once you get a job in the real world, everything resets. I, I, I've hired guys here lately. I don't ever know if I've ever asked the guy what his GPA was. I mean, uh, I've got one college kid I'm hiring right now, but other than that, it's usually what's your, what's your background? Do you have a degree? What's it in? That doesn't really matter anymore. It's about performance in from that end. So what you kind of see is you, there's a reset button every time you, you kind of kind of go through different phases in your life here. Now, for me, so when I came to school, it was I'm involved in everything I could be involved in. Uh, I, I made really good grades, and my objective was to, to learn. All right, so my mindset, like I told you, was a growth mindset. And this is what entrepreneurial's mindset is. It is a growth mindset. And that's what I'm going to kind of harp on this a little bit. So if, if I, now when I'm telling you I made good grades, I had a four point in engineering. I think I graduated 385. All right, now I failed test at school. I, you know, I, I got F's on test. But I have a growth mindset. My mindset is, okay, what, I'm, what did I not do? In, in order to get that grade, what, it, what do I need to do next time to become better? Because so then, because basically you learn from your failures as you go. Well, so then, then it's okay. I got to step up to the plate again, just like in business, and I got to change my approach. So in school, I had the same issues. Everybody, I was no smarter than anybody else. I just had a, a certain way that I worked and a certain way that I got through. But one thing I did figure out in school is this: is I studied with the 4.0 guys. Much easier studying with super smart people because if you can't figure it out, they can probably figure it out real fast. And if you're in an engineering school, you only have so much time in a day to get things done. So what I was able to do is, is build my resume to the point when I came out of school, I was pretty highly recruited. And uh, my whole thought process then, now, you know, I got a, I got a good mindset, I got a good thought process, I was going to go be a lawyer. I had some interest in patent law, so some people had some patent law, but then I had one guy that uh, ran a big air conditioning company that kept calling me and wearing me out for like a year. So I'm like, he's like, you need to come see, before you make a decision, you need to come see what we're doing. Now, he had a position for me to sell, sell products. So he uh, got me a ticket. I flew from Golden Triangle to Memphis. He picked me up in his $100,000 car, took me to his mansion. Then I went to each of his sales guys' mansions the next two nights and had dinner. So I said, well, there may be something to this. Maybe something to the selling side of things. So then I went ahead and took the job with him. So when I took the job with him, I wasn't making any money. Now, I was 100% commission. So that means I got paid when I sold something. So they gave me what they call a draw account for 30 grand a year. All right, so here I was, top guy coming out. I'm making 30 grand. All my buddies are making 65. Because they're taking these, you know, high-profile jobs. But I'm thinking, well, I saw the Mercedes, my, my, the guy picked me up, I saw his big house, I saw the opportunity here, so I'm like, okay. And what, I was, what, what ended up happening is I, I spent a lot of time with a lot of older guys in the, in the business. And in the business at a young age, I found a bunch of guys that could mentor me through the process. And when I say mentor me through the process is this, to become an expert in what you're doing is about 10,000 hours, okay? So you look at, you know, you got about 20, 2,200 hours a, a traditional work year for any, any guy, so it'd be a five-year deal if you're at it. So what I do, I worked 100 plus hours a week for like five years. I mean, I was just killing it because I didn't have any kids, you know, I was married, but we didn't have any money, so we're already broke, it didn't matter. I mean, it's time to learn something. It's time to, it's time to go get it, which y'all at a young age right now, man, it's time to go get it, you know. I mean, I could live, live on Roman noodles and canned corn and all that stuff. No sense of jumping up to the, to the high-end market yet because you're here to learn. You're here to grow. You're here to become better at what you do. So having these good mentors allowed me at 25 years old to make $400,000 a year. 
And I was topping almost a million by the time I was 30. All right? Now, that being said is, now I'm just an engineer. All right? But I'm an engineer that figured out how to leverage my relationships with people, how to, how to work under some of these older guys that really knew what they are doing. Because part of coming out and learning, learning a business model, learning, learning the business aspect of things, is learning from guys that are experienced. I mean, there, there's no way you can just all of a sudden read a book, come out, and, and, and make it happen. You got to have some experience from somebody somehow, some way. And a lot of, a lot of guys nowadays don't, don't want that. They, they think you should come out and start paying them some major, major money. My whole thought process of this is, if I'm coming out of school right now and somebody's going to pay me a fortune, then their expectations, I got to fulfill those shoes and make that kind of money, or in a year I'm going to be gone. Rather than someone that's got a big growth plan for me, that's going to have, you know, hey, the sky's the limit, but we're going to grow at this pace. Now I got, I got a chance. I got a chance to learn. I got a chance to become, you know, better and, 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 and smarter at what I do. And so what I did is I worked for this company for a long time. And what I ended up, well, it's a long time, 14 years, what I ended up doing is I became expert in certain, certain aspects of this marketplace. So most of the hotel, motel resorts, now I'm in the air conditioning business. I did them, I did them around here. All the casinos except one I sold as a kid because nobody was in that market. I got in that market, I started working the deals from that end. Um, and then I expanded that outside this area. So most of the large resorts in the southeast, I had a hand in somehow, some way as a young guy getting into the business. But like I said, I had a lot of older mentors that, that, that knew, how to, knew how to make it happen. And what I did is I did that up until I was about 35 years old and I started seeing these corporations changing. Because when I came out of school, the business I, I was in, everybody was a franchise basically. Meaning, meaning it was kind of like you had four air conditioning manufacturers, so you had four different franchises and individuals owned them. And they built a business model out of them. And then what happens, the corporations started buying them or taking them back. And so when corporations, big corporations take, them, take, take uh, businesses back, what they do is they forget about the customer, they start cutting heads, and they started taking money out of my pocket and giving it to the executives above me. So if you can imagine this, I'm a sales guy and I make more than the guy running the business. They don't like that, so they start changing it. Well, since I knew the business, I knew how, how to run the business, I knew all aspects of the business, and I'll talk to you about, about the aspects of the business here in a second. I'm like, you know, I can do it better than these guys. I know how to make it happen. And I took myself and another guy, we, we, we decided to be business partners in it. We were the top performers. We were 80% of the profit for this whole operation in Memphis. So I took him and I took two other people. So four of us went and started a business. And when we started a business, the interesting thing was this, is, you know, people go, well, are you scared? Well, no, because... I was a 100% commission sales guy for 14 years. I mean, sometimes I didn't get paid for six months as I got older at it, and I just took, took the money when it, was, when it came in. I mean, it was, wasn't no big deal to me. Um, went and got a small line of credit for the bank, had enough cash to operate on for at least a year. So in my mind, I was good to go, and all I did was started tapping into all my relationships in the marketplace. So. What I'm getting at is this. So what I did is this. First of all, I understood the business. I learned the business. All right. Now, once you learn the business, you'll be, you'll, you'll be surprised at how good you become at that business. And what I mean for this is we're talking this morning. And some of y'all, everybody, anybody seen The Matrix? I know it's an older show. It's probably not as cool as it was when I was young. But, um, and you know how the guy, he can see stuff. People can't see it. Well, I can see stuff in my business now. I, it's just it's like an innate ability because of, of how long I've done it that I can see what, what, what needs to come next. I can, I can see how it's going to operate in five, ten years. And a lot of guys that, that are really involved in their, in their marketplace, can, they understand what I'm talking about because they see it too. Well, with that being the case, I can see the changes. I can see what's coming on. And I saw what we needed to do. So we started up, and in three months, we were, we were positive cash flow. And what... When I told you we understood the business, the second thing is we understood the customer base. So the customer base in my area are my buddies. I mean, you know, I've been selling to them for a long time. Most of them are private businesses. They want to see, see me be successful. 
So for them to go slay the big corporations, they like that. So all my buddies were, was, was who I was doing business with because they want, they want me to succeed and they knew what, the value that I could bring to them from a, from a, from a pure sales standpoint and from, from a product application standpoint. And so what we ended up doing over time is we started, I mean, we were churning, we were churning some, some massive sales. We, we sold so much equipment that we had to slow down because we're outside on our cash. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this. In business, I have to buy and resell products. So if I'm going to sell a piece of equipment to go in a building, I've got to buy it first, and I've got to sell it to somebody else. Now, you have some that will pay you commission to sell it, but a lot of my stuff is buy-sell. So if you outsell your cash, then you don't have any cash to go buy stuff you just sold. So that was a, you know, a rude awakening to me. So the one I started, so as a, as a young guy, what I realized pretty quick is, man, I've got to get my line of credit up quicker, fast. I need, to stop, you know, I need to stop trying to operate on cash only. So that's when I, when I really became real good buddies with, with, with my banker now, who pretty much, you know, I, I probably, as long as I was standing with him, I probably got $10 million outstanding with him, if you add it all up. But we have a good relationship. If I need something, he understands my business well enough that he, he'll, he'll, he'll put the cash up and the cash will be available so that I can do a deal. So if I need to do a monster deal at one time, he understands my business enough, I can call him, the money's available for me to do it, rather than me having to depend on my cash. Because what you real, you'll figure out real quick in business is cash is king, man. And you want to hold on to your cash as much as you can. So when you go buy trucks and vehicles and stuff like that, you want to finance that stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. You rarely want to pay cash unless it just makes total sense. Because, uh, and then when you open your line of credit stuff and you keep them open. Because when you need cash is normally when people won't give it to you. So that's, you know, that's kind of a, a quick thing I learned at a, at a, young, at a young age. All right, so, so that kind of gets a little bit through my background of where I started with my own business. Now, from the business side of things, once we started, it was about growing it. And what it is, is I knew the model I wanted to, to achieve in business. There's a business model for mine. So I'll tell you a little bit about mine. So my background is a commercial air conditioning. And so what we are is we are a group of engineers that put together building systems. So we'll put together like a system that will run this building itself, where you have the air handlers, chillers, VV boxes, and the controls that control the building. And you sell it as a package system in the marketplace and to make it so, so it'll work and function as a system itself. Now, um, there's a lot of my bu business that sell parts and pieces of it, but our, our, our big selling point is that we sell the system. And when it goes in, it's going to work as a system. And um, so with that being the case, my whole business is built around a, syst a systematic business. And what I mean by that is this, is my business has four, four parts to it, okay? You have a sales component, which is an equipment sales component. And all my sales guys are, are engineers of some type because they have to understand how to engineer a system and put it together. Then you have a service component. You've got to have some means of servicing the equipment when you sell it. All right, you got to have a controls component, which is a, a, a system that can control it all to make it all work together. I like a control system that runs your car and stuff like that. You, know, you don't have to go out there and turn the crank anymore to start your car. Same with the air conditioning system. you got a control system that controls it all. Then the fourth aspect is the parts. i gotta have, I got to have a part supply chain to be able to, to, to supply parts for this equipment that we have. And so if you got all four parts of this business, then you got a, a solid, solid business in my marketplace. And so the first component I had was equipment. I didn't have the parts. I didn't have the other components. So then the second component I, I put together was parts. All right? Third component I put together was controls. And the last component I put together was service. But what I did on that is I had to really go find it and go get it. And I had to get my equipment stuff running up enough and make enough cash flow to be able to afford to, to invest in the other side. So, for instance, equipment, my investment on the equipment side wasn't that much. We're, we're positive cash flow in, in three months. But my, my parts, I, had, I put two million in, into it over three years before I started making money. And the reason is two things is the first problem I had is I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, so I had a you know trial and error. Luckily, I had enough cash. It didn't it didn't matter. I could I could work my way out of it. On the sales side of it, when the equipment sale is, if I ever had a cash problem, I could sell my way out of it. All right. 
But the parts is a little different. You're dealing, you're dealing with a little different ball game on that. And so we kind of figured out how to, how to um, trim the model and where I have parts locations in different parts of this, of this region that sell different products based on what the region wants, rather than me trying to sell one product at all, to everybody. Then the next aspect was uh, building controls. So building controls, I'm Siemens. So everybody knows Siemens is a big name. Uh, they have a lot of technology, so, so it's real interesting. So building controls is Siemens. My flagship equipment company is Daikin. It's the largest air conditioning company in the world. And so I got Siemens controls, which was good. I already had the parts wholesale distribution, which was Daikin, which is good. Then what I was able to do is go to Daikin and, get, let the, and, and, let, and cut a deal with them to, to get the factory service branch, which is a big deal in my business. So most of my competitors are factory service guys. So my competitors are Train, Carrier, York, which is Johnson. Does anybody know those, those, those players out there? Okay, that's who I compete against every day. All right, so they all have factory service. They're all like a factory branch. And a lot of people like that. So what I did is I basically worked to deal with Daikin to become factory service, like a franchise. So, I, so if you see a truck that says Daikin on it, it's my truck. Um, I, my, my brand is Ewing Kessler, which is, you'll see an EK logo with a circle, or EK with circle around. That's my brand in the marketplace. But, you know, I'm proud of my brand, but we're here to make money and service people. You know, so I'm going I'm to run up what logo makes the most sense at that, at that time. So now I have all, all four parts of my business. Since I have four parts of my business, now I can compete against the other three major players. Before, I was just one of the many, many guys out there. Everybody I compete against are large corporations. I'm the only independent in my town, okay? Good and the bad. Um, the good is, is I can outmaneuver anything they want. Well, anything that, that they're doing, it takes them six to eight months to make a decision. I make a decision like now. So, for instance, when I wanted to start my own service operation, I went and bought like, I don't know, I got eight total techs, I got 14. I bought eight trucks and put them out back. Well, the whole marketplace is like, what the hell is he doing? He's got eight trucks out there. Well, I'm fixing to get in the service business. So then I walked across the street to the, my big competitor, and I hired all their guys to come work for me. All right, so you think they like me now? No, I, my name is probably not very good in their corporate, you know, up, up, at, up at their corporate headquarters right now. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not well liked. But the deal is, is I was able to offer their guys an incentive package that the corporations couldn't offer. Because guess what? They're standardized. They're like the U.S. government. You got pay levels. You got all this stuff. Well, I don't care, man. I give, I give their guys different deals, and they could never offer a deal like that because they didn't have to offer it across the United States. They're not going to do that. So now I outmaneuver and outsmart them. Now I just got to start outselling them with my techs. So that's, that's, that's the realm we're in right now with that business. Now the parts side of the house, I'm, I, and I'll tell you a little bit about it because it's a different business I'm in. Um, so you'd think parts would be easy to set up like an auto zone. Well, and I signed up with Daikin who has their own parts. Well, Daikin is segmented parts. They're not like a wholesale parts warehouse. So what I had to do is when I go buy product to put in my store, I look like one little guy. I don't look like one big guy across the United States. So what I've done now is I've taken everybody like me, because I'm an independent guy, and since I'm part of Daikin, Daikin's different than everybody else. We're still independents. All the guys like me, they only have four factory stores. All of them across the United States are independents. And so what I've done is I went and I pulled us all together to look like one group to go buy. So now we're, we're working on right now putting together a buyer's group like a co-op to go buy for our parts distribution so we can buy at, at better pricing and not look like one guy in the marketplace. So what I'm basically trying to tell you here is this, is my, my migration of my business is based off of successful businesses before. It's not based off me being, being any, any brighter thinking of some widget. No, man, it's taking a business model and trying to perfect it with another group because a lot of the corporations have abandoned the franchise business model, and that's what I did is I took it and I expanded off of it, and I got other guys to buy in with me to do it. So part of business in general is this. Every business is the same in theory. It all looks the same. So 
I'm leveraging people, but more enough, I'm leveraging equipment. If you leverage people the whole time, man, that's a lot of overhead to run through. So if my company does 40 million in sales a year, I got seven to eight service tax, okay? I got, I got one of my buddies across the street, he has 40 tax. You know how much 40 tax? That's, that's $10 million. That's all he can do with 40. So I got eight plus equipment, I can do 40 million. He's got 40, he can only do 10 because he's selling labor. Well, I'm selling labor and I'm selling equipment, so I got margin stuff on equipment and I'm selling a concept, which is so a lot of it's intangible stuff. Like controls business. That's an intangible business. It's like software, it's a, it's a black box. You know, sometimes you're going to pay $2,000 for the software, then in two or three years, it may be worth 200 bucks. And that's, that's, that's how the leverage part's on the business. So part of the stuff on the, on the entrepreneurial side of a business is what are you trying to leverage? You're trying to leverage people? You're trying to lever, leverage product? I mean, if you're trying to leverage yourself, then you've got to hire more people to, to, to make yourself more valuable. So me personally, I got 45 employees, and so I need to leverage every employee the best I can to maximize the dollar. So part of what I want to do as a company is I got a, I got a dollar, even down to the lady answering the phone. I, need to, I want 100 million ahead in sales. So that's kind of our deal. We're going to start adding people. We got, we got, our sales have to go up. They, they, we're just not adding people, just to add them. Uh, and you'll be surprised how many opinions I get, which I listen to them. People who work for me now, you got to sit down and listen to their opinion of what I should be doing. When some of it's good stuff, but a lot of it is they want to hire people and uh, to do the job they don't want to do and me to hire some more people to do it. So, you know, that's just kind of part of, part of business from that aspect of it. Now, the... And, and so now, since I got all four aspects of my business together, what am I doing with it now? What I do with it now is I have to build a business that is sellable, but I do not want to sell it. Because my business has no value if it takes me to make it work every day. You know, if, if it took Fred Smith every day to make FedEx work, it wouldn't, FedEx wouldn't have near the value. I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate goal of a business is get it to the point where it doesn't have, you don't have to be there every day to make it work. And if you can, now your business has some worth. Now it's got some traction. Now it can move from that end. Um, the, other, the other big aspect of it I wanted to kind of explain a little bit too is we have some business people here. Is anybody in here getting an MBA? Some of y'all get an MBA? I wish I'd, I wish I'd have got an MBA. I mean, I, I was, you know, four and a half, five years through engineering school. I'm like, man, I got enough school. I'm, I need to get out of this place. You know, it just it gets monotonous, which I can, I can appreciate that. So all of my education when it comes to financing, financials, uh, how to understand it, how to uh, implement it is reading books and self-taught. But it had been nice if I'd have got an MBA and actually had a business, some business background that I could, I could move a little faster. I think that would help me out. So my sons, they're going to go get an MBA. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it as hard as I can on it. Now, and then they're going to get an MBA, I want them to get an Ivy League school MBA. Um, undergraduate, we just, we're, going to, we're going to spend our money on the, on the graduate side of things, is my, my plan with my boys, if that's what they want to do. You know, who knows, uh, they, may just, they may want to go with snow ski for two or three years and actually get a real job, that's what some, some people I see do. Um, but uh, the other thing, too, is business itself is divided up into two parts. You got sales and operations. Everybody has a sales, everybody has an operation. Now you want to make, you could, you could delve it down into marketing and all that, but you got a sales and ops. What I've learned is this, if I got a sales guy running a company, I can outsell my problems. If I got an ops guy running my po co company, I can have big problems because of the, of the mindset that a person has. So for instance, the guy that runs my sales organization is a sales guy. Now he drives me nuts, Sometimes because he doesn't care about the operation. Meaning, you want to do what, and I got to, I got to get it done in how many days? Well, no, man, we sold it. It's, it's good. Okay, well, I got an operation problem now. But if I'd had an operation guy running my sales, then what he'd be, he'd be so cautious, we'd never sell anything. All right, so that's kind of a caveat I learned pretty, pretty well on that deal. The other thing I learned, too, is this, is, you have to have a good ops. You, you have to have a solid operation because you will fall miserably on your face if you cannot have a good group of folks that can implement what you do. I mean, I can have a really lean sales force that can move a lot of product, 
and I may need to have a heavy ops that can implement it. So I'd rather spend my money on high-end sales guys and keep, keep a few of them and spend a lot of money to make sure my ops is solid because that's a big deal. If I can't get stuff done on what I've already committed to to my customer base, that's a problem. The second thing is, too, is it, you need to fall in love with your customer base. It's about meeting people's needs. Everything we're doing is about meeting people's needs. And if, you, if you're concerned more about yourself than your customer base, you're going to have a big problem over time. So let me give an example. So the product that we took it over in Memphis, um, Daikin, it's now, they changed the name to Daikin because it's, been, it's, been, it's evolved a little bit. Um, it had 1% market share. 1%. Now we're running 35 to 40, so now we're a big player, okay? Now, so having 1% market share probably meant nobody took care of the product. So the first thing I had to do, my business partner and I, we had to, act like, we had to come in there and show people we cared. We're not acting like we care, we had to show them we cared. So I spent $300,000 fixing everything in town I could find that was broken. Because I, I can't have my stuff not working. So now, in the marketplace, people know, you buy from me, it's going to work. I don't care if it costs me a fortune. I, it's got to work. Because guess what? I don't have a Fortune 500 company I can hide behind. I only got is my reputation. And the reputation in business is worth everything. I mean, it's, it's worth, you can't, put a, you can't put a dollar figure on it from that end. So that's one thing that, that we, we pride ourselves in. And what's really interesting is this. So if I got a problem with a piece of equipment, we had a problem with a piece of equipment, Factory couldn't help us. We couldn't get it fixed. We just ripped it out. It cost me 100000 We just shipped it back to the factory and said, here's your POS back. We're going to put another one in, and then we're going to work it out with you later. I've got to take care of this customer. All right. Well, if you look at the corporate environment and you had that problem, you had to go through management, and about four months later, maybe you get a decision, and now you've got a customer that won't ever buy from you again. And now you don't have, your reputation is not intact. So that's kind of what we pride ourselves for being the private side of it is the money will come if you do the right thing. And so the first thing is what does the customer need? And then when I sell it to him, what, what benefit is he getting out of it if, if he's happy with it to do repeat business? So on the sales cycle, if you, I don't know if y'all, y'all don't study sales one-on-one. It's just more of the business side of it, don't you? All right, so you got different sales approach. Anybody taking Sandler or Wilson Learning or anything? Y'all, anybody taking any sales class at all? All right, so when I, was, when I came up to the business, I learned something called counselor selling. And so counselor selling has four steps. You relate, you discover, you advocate, and you support. All right, so part of the sales process is when I'm, I want to relate with people first because when I meet you, you meet me. I don't trust you, you don't trust me. Tension's higher, right? So what I need to do is I need to start finding something common to get the tension down so we can start a conversation. So if I'm meeting somebody new and I walk in their office and they look around, man, they, got me, they may have a picture of somebody playing golf or, you know, they got their kids. And I start asking questions about their kids. And I get, I get the tension, tension down. The next step is once, once you start getting the tension down and gaining their trust, before I'm going to try to solve their problem, I've got I to discover so part of it is asking a bunch of questions, figuring out what their needs are to figure out what, they're, what I need to be focusing on. Then the next part is I come back and I advocate. I advocate a solution to them. So when someone's talking to me, I don't sit there and go through my, oh, man, this will work, this will work. Maybe I may be thinking in my head, but I'm asking questions enough. So when I come back, we'll talk about what, what's the best solution. But then the, the ultimate key in the end is this, is support. Is once you sell something to somebody, you've got to support it all the way through the process, good, bad, or indifferent. And you have to continue telling them they made a good buying decision. Or they get what they call buyer's remorse. You ever bought something like wish you'd never bought it? Spent a bunch of money on a car or motorcycle or four-wheeler and like, man. Well, if you went back to a good guy that sold it to you, he'd tell you how great, it, how great a decision you made and, and how this thing's going to help you through life or help you out there. I mean, that's just kind of how, how it all works from that end. So that's one thing you'll start learning on the, on the side, on this whole entrepreneurial side of things is, you want to learn how to sell. Because everybody, this whole business revolves around selling something. I don't know, is there anybody ever read Steve Jobs' book? You hadn't read it before? It's pretty interesting. He was a selling machine. 
And he used to drive his ops guys crazy because he would outsell what his ops guys could do and then commit to all this stuff. So, you know, that would be a good one to read if you want to kind of get a different idea on how some people think through some things and how they kind of evolve uh, through a process. Um, All right, one of one of the thing I want to talk about is is uh, goals, and I know people talk about goals in general, um, and business is about setting goals. And what I'm saying goals are this is goals are dynamic; they're not static. All right, so for instance, if I got a goal that I need to sell X amount, and I, I know that's where I want to get to, so so give you give you for instance. If I got a certain amount I want to sell in, in my company, I do reverse math. What if I want to sell, for, I, let's say I want to make $2 million, and my net profit before tax on my business is 10%, so I need to sell $20 million. So I go, okay, I want to make $2 million, I need to sell $20 million, I'm going to do reverse math back to how much I need to sell, down to how much each sales guy need, needs to sell, so now i got a goal. Well, w once you set that goal, then it's, okay, now how I'm going to reach that goal. So then you start analyzing the process, how you're going to reach it. And what you'll start doing is you'll start putting the game plan together. But guess what happens with the game plan? What you started off with and what you end up with are two different things. You wanted to go this way, and you're probably going to end up doing this all the way through if you've got a, if you got a growth mindset and you're trying to think through the process because you're going, to, you're going to hit obstacles as you go. So one thing you start thinking about when you start putting your own business together and what, what, what goals you're trying to reach, what you got to do, you got to be flexible enough to know that in order to reach, reach your goal, stuff may change. Stuff is going to, stuff, obstacles are going to be in front of you, and you got to just be able to kind of maneuver around it. No, that's just part of the process from that end. The other thing that I, that I figured out, too, is this, is anything I want, I write it down, and i got a list of stuff I, I wrote down. I read that every morning, and I think about it. And I'll focus on it. And what ends up happening, believe it or not, man, if you think about something long enough and you focus on it, you will, you will get it. Now, there's a bad part of that, too. I got some stuff I focused on and I got I wish I could get back. You know, it's, it's one of those deals. But, um, you know, I've been able to be fairly successful in what I do by having good people that work for me and a good customer base. And, I mean, we got all the cool stuff. We got planes. We got pilots. We got all that stuff. I mean, we got cars. We got big houses, all that great stuff. But I'll tell you, in the end, right now, it's not about that stuff anymore. Right now, for me, um, once you start making a lot of money and you start growing and you start doing, you start figuring out, now, every time I make money, I, I figure out what am I going to do with it next. It's not, what am I going to go buy? It's like, okay, uh, we just made all this money. What are we going to do? What, what, what new venture are we going to get into? Where are we going to put it to grow? Where, where, what do we want to? It's almost like, it's almost like you, you're, you're playing a game, but you're not. Because right now, for me, I'm not working anymore, man. This is just part of my life, and this is fun. And, you know, some days I'm, I'm worn out. Some days I'm just energized, ready to keep going. And that's what a lot of this, the building side of a business is about, is, man, if it's treacherous and, it's, and it sucks and it's not any fun, man, you may, you may be in the wrong marketplace. You may be doing something else. But if it's fun, entertaining, exciting, you're helping people, you're building stuff, you know, that's kind of what it's all about. In my, in my mind and in my world. And if you step really far back and you look at the big picture as this is, is first of all is, is you might as well work as hard as you can, when I'm saying as hard as, you, as hard as you want to. There's a difference between wanting to and, and thinking you have to. Um, and, and understand that evolving through life People have a lot of fear, fear of failure. They got a fear that I'm going to run out of money or I'm going to go broke and all that stuff. But think about this, man. The, you know, you only got so many years of life in this world, all right? And you can't take it with you. So guess what? You may lose it two or three times, but if you got the right mindset, you can always make it back. You know, I got two or three buddies that have gone under a couple times, but they always made it back because they figured it out. But, they, but their whole thought process, how they, they, they look at things is every obstacle is a learning process for me to get to the next phase. I mean, the most impressed guys I have been impressed of are the guys that damn near lost everything but, but came back again. 
And, man, I learned a lot talking to those guys and try to understand, you know, what business is all about from that perspective. Um, trying to think if I had anything else I just wanted to kind of highlight here. But if not, yeah, I can open up for questions. Anybody got any questions? We've probably got about 15 minutes left. Go ahead. Sure. Who? Well, they do. Not in my market. No, we're located in Memphis. I got offices in Memphis, Hernando, Greenwood, Jackson, Mississippi. I got guys in Tupelo and on the coast. But we play in this marketplace. So the way my, my deal to set up is this, is I do work all over the southeast. Now, I got, you know, I mentioned airplane and pilots and all that. I got to have that to be able to travel to do the work because we service a lot of stuff outside of here and we do a lot of big facilities. Um, but the way my, my contracts read with who I'm doing business with, as long as it's bought in my territory, I can go anywhere in the United States. So as long as the purchasing done here by, by, by companies, contractors, owners, I can travel and do work. So I got, man, I got work all over the place. Go ahead. Do we have internships? Not right now. I have uh, one right now, he's finishing up, but once I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to migrate him out to selling right now and maybe in a couple of years, but not right now. Any more questions? All right, so, so the question was, how did I cut my deal with Daikin? All right, so this is the evolution of my marketplace. The air, all air conditioning companies... So, so you got Daikin, you got Train, you got Carrier York. They're all built from small companies. So, for instance, in my marketplace is this, is I need all these components to build this building. Well, most of these, most of these manufacturers or, or large air conditioning companies only have one component. So what they did is they went and bought little guys to build a big business up. All right? So, so... So Daikin did that, Train did that, you know, Train bought Command Air, they bought GE rooftops to kind of build it up. So now they got this big monster portfolio of products under one roof. Well, what Daikin was, Daikin's a Japanese company. And, the, and Daikin wanted to get into the United States. So Daikin builds a, a product called Variable Refrigerant Flow Systems or VRV Systems, mini splits. And that is 60% of the world has that, buys that product. You don't, you didn't, it didn't have been in the U.S. that long. Only 60% of the world buys that product. We don't that much around here in the United States. And, and I'm going to make this long story short about Daikin. Daikin failed three times getting in the U.S. They couldn't penetrate it because the U.S. is a relationship business. It, it doesn't matter if you have the greatest stuff in the world. Over in Europe, it's all technology. They sell on technology, not on relationships. It's different. Here, it's relationships. If you don't have a relationship, I don't care how good your stuff is, you're not going to sell it. It's just how it is in the United States. And so what they did is in order to get in the United States, they bought, they bought a company called McQuay. McQuay was a company, it was a conglomerate of a lot of companies. And they bought McQuay to get into to it. And that's what I was, I was McQuay at first. So to give you an idea, McQuay used to own Heatcraft in Grenada. I don't know, y'all know where Heatcraft is over there. So that was just a, an air conditioning facet of their business. So what ended up happening is this, so, so Daikin has their, their, product that they invented, now this, the stuff that 60% of the world, they invented that. They invented this product. They came to the U.S. one in the U.S. market because it's a big market. They started buying McQuay. Then the next step is they bought Goodman. Now they're the largest air conditioning company in the world. Well, when you come into the U.S. and you are the largest air conditioning company in the world and you haven't been in the U.S. long, that means you have no people presence, right? So you have train carrier. York's been here for 50 years. Well, they've already had their service companies built up and they had all this built up. So part of Daikin's problem is this, is you can't hire enough people in the United States to start a business from scratch. You gotta leverage people. They tried it with the service and it didn't work. So I saw it didn't work, I came to them with a business plan and what they did is I signed a contract with them to become a, a factory service office. And there's probably about 18 of us in the whole US. And that's, that's the whole US is only 18, there should be about 100. And Daikin's trying to, sign these guys up one at a time. So we put a business plan together in order to get that aspect of the business. But that aspect of the business is a big part. Because if you sell something, you've got to service it. If you bought a car from a, a dealership, you want them to service it. 
especially under warranty. You want to take it to some jack leg that doesn't know what he's doing, and that becomes a problem. Does that answer your question? All right. Hey, one more thing I'll tell you, too, is this. Is Daikin is not for sale. And what I mean by that is all these other companies are for sale. You look at Linux, just got bought. Um, Siemens was looking at spinning out their controls division. You look at uh, JCI, talked, they, just, they just sold off their building, uh, building uh, uh, facilities management company. Well, Daikin is started by the Japanese. Japanese are long-term holders of businesses. So I have a CEO in Daikin that I get to talk to that has a 20-year plan. You look at all these other manufacturers, they got a CEO that's going to be there five years. So he's got a five-year plan. So in five years, his whole business could change. In five years, he's got his golden parachute is out. I'm dealing with guys that are 20-year guys. So when they make long-term commitments, they can keep them, and I can work with them on long-term commitments, which is really good for my business. I don't need a five-year plan and it blow up in my face. It's not any fun. Anybody have any more questions? What was my, what now? The biggest risk that I took that was my biggest success? Um, pro probably the biggest, the biggest risk that I took, um, I'm just trying to think on what that would be. I've done a lot of them. I'm going to tell you one thing I got, um, which, which would be interesting, is I invest in other companies, okay? And uh, I've rolled the, uh, rolled the bonds with some of those companies. Well, those companies right now make me as much money as I make a year at the company I own. And guess what? I don't have to touch them anymore, which is a good thing. So it just comes in the, I call it mailbox money, it just comes in the mailbox, which is real good stuff. But... I'm just trying to think on the big, biggest risk I took. If, if you wanted, people call it risk, maybe leaving a Fortune 500 company to start my own business would be a, considered a big risk because I leveraged everything I owned to do it. I didn't pay myself for a year. You know, my wife's looking at me like, okay, the money's running out. What are we going to do? I said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And so here I am now. When I say a big, I guess it would be a big risk. I got nice house, nice, nice everything. My kids go to private school, got a live-in nanny. It's a lot of overhead, right? So I'd take a big risk to kind of jump at that. Probably the biggest risk I took was start my own business. But it was probably the most fulfilling thing that I, that I was able to do. Yes? No, I tell you, the, what I want to do is to get it to where it runs itself and I'm in and out because I'm a big idea guy. And that's really where, where right now I think I'm best at. I'm best at looking at the vision of where I want to go, look at the background, spend the time putting together what I want to do from the big picture side of things. And would I really ever want to step, step away from it and, and quote, retire? No, man. I, what am I, I mean, retirement is... I mean, there's things I want to do in life that I do. I mean, I, I teach myself a lot of things that I want to, that, that I want to accomplish and, and become better at, but I never thought about, you know, just taking my money and leaving. I, I mean, it makes, for me, it makes no sense. I mean, if you got, if you got good money coming in and you, you like what you do, I don't think I'd ever get to the point where I, I'd do that. Pinnacles keep on going, keep on growing, keep on doing different things. I mean, if you, if you look at most of these big successful guys, they're doing something. Um, and, I mean, because you think about it, what am I going to do? I'll stop. Yeah, I got millions of dollars, and I can live off that, but then what am I going to do? You can only play so much golf and do so much things. And, you know, right now, I mean, in, I'm, at the, I'm at the prime of my career. I mean, I, I'm where I can make things happen. So I'm going to keep making it as long as I can, but I have no plan to retire. I don't know if my kids want to do it. If my kids don't want to do it, I'll just sell it to my, some of my, high, my, my key employees. But, but you've you got to understand, too, is this. Now, businesses, my business is not for sale, but if the right package came along, everybody's going to think about it. I mean, that's just, that's, just, that's just life. Now, if I were to get out of it, then I'm going to do something else with it. 
I'm not just going to take it and, and go home with it. That just, that's just not me uh, from, from my standpoint. Well, the, the biggest thing is when you spend your time building relationships in a marketplace, you need to realize, I mean, I had, I had a, 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 an older guy sit down and, and, and sit down with me and talk to me about it because when I was 35, you know, I, I wanted out. I was looking at maybe going somewhere else. But then I'm sitting there with, like I said, some guys, some older guys, some of my mentors, and we're talking, and they're like, man, where's your relationships? You know, where, where are they? Well, they're here. Well, then you, why don't you stay here? And you, if not, you've got to build everything again. Well, I'd rather build a company with good relationships than have to go get, you know, build relationships in a company. That's tough. That's real tough. And then I like this. Man, this is a, this is a, a, this is a good old boy marketplace, man. I mean, you, you can trust people, you get to know people. It's a great place, great environment around here. Um, there's a lot to offer, a lot of growth. I mean, you got manufacturers moving down here all the time. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a growth marketplace. Texas, man, it is like cutthroat. The, the guys and in, 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 in my counterparts in Houston are jealous of what we can do here because of, of what they have to go against every day. I mean, they're, they're, they, everybody and the brother wants to sell in those big markets. Not everybody wants to in the mid, in mid, mid markets. They don't want to. They don't all want to be here. And in my business, um, profit didn't discriminate. You know, it's like I was telling somebody: if you're in my business and you're 100% commission sales guy, in theory, and you got you working in California, well, if you make a half a million dollars here, as opposed to making a half a million dollars in California, it goes a lot longer here, right? And the opportunity to do that is 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 here because I'm not stuck here. We got accounts here that I can sell stuff to in Texas and other locations, so that my market's open. Anybody got uh, any more questions? Well, the first thing is this: is you know, before you you want to sell people something, you got to, I mean, you got to get to know people. They have to trust you first. So part of building my, my relationships with, with, uh, with my group of guys is spending time getting to know them. When, uh, and then when you're, and then be there for them when they need you. So part of it with me when I built relationships, first it became quick response. I had to have a low price, and it may be too low in the marketplace because I had to get them buying for me. Because if they get them buying from me, then, that, then I can start relating with them. You know, it's kind of like going out on a date, man. You got to kind of break the ice and start talking, start asking questions, start getting to know somebody before it's going to go any further than that. Business is the same way. Building a relationship with people is you got to figure out what is it, what is it that you can do to get them to start talking to you, start communicating with you, to start trusting in you. And in my business, first of all, is you got to be prompt response. The second thing that you had to do is you need to be real competitive so you can get a lot of the work. And once you get a lot of work, and they start buying stuff from you, you can prove your worth on how you perform for them at that time. Then the other thing is you got a lot of social functions you do with them. You find out what they like doing. I mean, you know, you got some guys that, that uh, you know, may like hunting, may like fishing. Some people like, may like going to events. Some people may like fine arts. You got to start relating with them and, and, and inviting them and doing things with them and spending time to get to know them. Um, and to me, it's, it's, it's a... It's a time, it, it just takes time to build relationships. But this is the other key. Once you build it, you need to keep it. And the only way you can keep it is you, you have to keep nurturing a relationship. You cannot, you cannot work real hard, build it, and then six months later forget about it because, hey, I already sold them, they already bought it, and I'm going to kind of go build it again. It's hard. But if you'd, if you'd, keep, if you'd call them every, you know, every, every few weeks and touch base them and stuff like that, you can keep that relationship going. The toughest thing is building a relationship. All right, the easiest thing is keeping it once you built it. But the hardest thing is to rebuild it once you, once you let it go. Kind of off an earlier conversation we were having, one of the students was asking, how difficult was it for you and how bad important was that to balance working and marrying these two All right, all right. So when I first started, that's why it's key for y'all at a young age is to really go at it in a big way and learn all you can as quick as you can. Because 
my wife and I, we didn't have kids. We got married at 20, 21, didn't have kids till we were 33. Okay, so that's 12 years. And um, it's 12 years of, of me being able to, to develop my career in, in my path. Now, some of y'all may have kids and may not, may not have that luxury that I had from that end. You know, I used to kid around with my buddies that they couldn't come play golf with me because they had to go take care of their kids. And then since my kids are older, you know, they already are done with kids. They're calling me and saying, hey, man, we're at Pinehurst going to play golf. You want to come? We're going to fly out this weekend. I'm like, no, I can't. I can't do it now. They start giving me a hard time. But, but the big thing is this is with, with my relationship with my wife and my kids and stuff like that is I'm very good at, at integrating my work with my family life. And what I mean by that is this is, is I don't ever really in theory take a vacation. I take my work, work with me so I can spend time with my family and my kids. And it keeps it moving. So if we're going to go snow skiing, we're going to go to Disney, I'm going to take my stuff and I'm going to get up early. And I'm going to be disciplined enough to get my work done before they wake up, before we start doing stuff during the day so I can spend time with them. If not, you're going to get trapped in this role. And the other thing I do too is this, is, is when, it's, when I'm home, I'm home. I try to put this phone aside and spend quality time during a certain period of time. I don't try to sit there and answer that phone the whole time. I really, really focus on splitting it off. Because what you'll find out in business, man, this stuff is 24-7. And you've got to figure out when to, when to cut it off and when to turn it back on. And you've got to be disciplined enough to do that. The problem that we're seeing right now is you've got this millennial group, which is kind of y'all's group coming up right now. And I was talking to Eric. I was in a seminar that uh, this lady wrote this book called 2020. And she said, in 2020, five generations of people are going to be working together. And the interesting thing is the millennial gen generation is this, is millennial generation cannot separate work from play. All right? That's, the, you know, the millennial group's the one that, I want to be able to have my iPhone at work and be able to use it all the time. Well, you're at work. When I, was a, when I first started in business, you had a work phone, and the only reason you ever got something that wasn't related to work coming through that phone was an emergency. That's just how it was. You, just, you, didn't, you didn't do personal stuff on the phone at work. It just didn't work that way. Well, now, with the, with the technology the way it is, the millennial group, they can't separate work and play. They don't, they don't understand why you, you're, 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 you should have a company phone, a personal phone, maybe. They don't understand why you shouldn't use your company's email for your personal email, too. They're confused about it. Um, and so, to me, that's a problem. That's going to be a problem with y'all's generation because at least I saw two sides of it from, from go, growing through it. So... I kind of know how to put the phone down, and, 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 and my life doesn't revolve around that, around that setup, and how to separate over time the work and the play side of it. Because I work and I play. I don't play while I work. I mean, that's just kind of how, how it goes. So maybe that answers the question. The, it, uh, right now, it's, it's con con controllable based on volume and profit level. And what I mean by this is that is, uh, for instance, I have controls that I sell in the marketplace. Well, controls requires labor. Um, service requires labor. Well, when I price up a controls job, there's so many, much labor versus material in a price. Well, the less labor that I have in my price, and the more material and stuff I have, I could probably be more cost competitive because it's not sucking up my resources. So I could take it for less money. So what I'm looking at from sales versus ops, I'm trying to look at my backlog of what I have versus the people I have, and do I have enough for the hours of work required to be done? And if I don't, I gotta start looking in the next four or five months to add people. Or there's some jobs out there I'm just going to pass on. I'm not going to take them. I'm not going to go try to really close them because I, I don't have the manpower to do it on that deal. Now, the opposite's true is if I don't have enough labor hours, I got too many, I don't have enough labor hours in these jobs based on the people I have, I may start talk, taking some work a little for a lower margin, lower profit level to keep my people working. 
So there's kind of a, there's a fine line that you got to watch, but it's, it's, it's a six-month window, you, and you got to watch that window. And we're right now putting process and procedures